to see you. Good to see you too. So good morning, Professor Henry Chesbrou. Henry, I mean, it's a great, great pleasure to have you here to talk about inno uh, to talk about innovation in the energy field. Just let me let me uh, tell you an anecdote that it happens to me this morning. I mean, my nine-year-old daughter. Uh, she asked me this morning, what are you going to do today, mommy? Say, I have a very important meeting with a very important person. And he said, who is he? Who is he? And I said, Henry Chesbro. And I showed you the book. Say, you know, Henry Chesbro, that's the man who wrote this book. And she was like, OK. But then she Googled you. Mm, okay. She took her iPad and she Googled you. And she said, wow, mommy. She's really famous. She's like J Justin Bieber. And he was like, <laughs> OK, <laughs> Justin Bieber. So it's, it's, it's fantastic because I don't know your singer skills. <laughs> we are not going to test it. But you are the father of open innovation. I mean, a concept that today is worldwide known, not only in the academia, but also in the business world, also the politicians. So it's just, just a starting question. How all this started? Because now you have this kind of impact, but how the open innovation concept came to you? How did you start researching about this topic? Well, good morning, and what a wonderful way to begin. Uh, if open innovation becomes as popular as Justin Bieber, then something good will have happened. <laughs> I'll be very happy. Where did it all begin? I would say there are two places where it began for me. One was before I became a professor, I worked for many years in the computer industry, and most of those years I spent in a hard disk drive company called Quantum. Mm -hmm. And we were a startup company in Silicon Valley. And we were competing against much larger, much more powerful companies like IBM. But we were winning. We were doing very well even though they were so strong and so powerful with so much intellectual property, so much R&D investment, and yet we were winning. So that was something that was very influential for me. Uh, the second piece, I think, began once I became a professor. I was teaching at Harvard Business School and got permission to do an extended series of studies at Xerox Corporation, mm -hmm. particularly the Palo Alto Research Center, or PARC. And I spent two years there uh, meeting lots of people uh, from many parts of Xerox, and they gave me wonderful access. And in the course of that time, I began to see the same dynamic I saw at Quantum, but instead of being in the startup, now I was looking at it from the perspective of the large company, Xerox. Uh, and I think these were the two places where open innovation really began to come alive for me, was seeing it from both of these sides. Mm -hmm. And I mean, back in time, at that moment, how, did you ever think that open innovation was going to be so popular as it is today? Absolutely not. <laughs> in fact, the year that my book came out in 2003 was the same year that Harvard kicked me out uh, and did not give me tenure. I had to leave and I went to Berkeley. So I was not feeling like I was Justin Bieber. I was feeling like, oh boy, maybe I failed here. So uh, I am of course today just delighted but at the time, it was not at all clear uh, how successful this was going to be. Well, it's, it's very similar to what they're really a sense of innovation, no? You try, you don't know what is going to be the result. Yes. And, and indeed, you are a living example of a false negative. Oh, that you talk good in your for books, you. No? Good for you. I very much agree with you. Let me say something about the false negative, because this is a concept that has not gone as far as I was hoping that it would. Lots of companies evaluate R&D projects at multiple stages mm -hmm. on the journey from the laboratory to the market. And they have these stages or stage gates they use as these evaluations are made. And many times, if a project gets all the way through each of these gates and it succeeds, everybody's happy. 
Also, if they go through every single gate, but then it fails in the market, people then go back and say, what did we do wrong? What did we miss? What the Xerox work showed me was there was another possibility where you evaluate a project and you say no. But in the case of Xerox, some of those projects actually continued on their own without further funding from Xerox. Instead, they got their funding from the venture capital community, and a few of them actually became very successful. So even though Xerox saw them first, they did not see the value. Mm -hmm. They did not see the possibility. But other investors did see a possibility and made the investment, and then they were able to be successful. So those were the false negatives. The ones that, to you and your business, don't look so promising. But to other people, looking at it another way, they see value that the first group did not see. Yes. Same thing with a different angle, with a different perspective. Yes. That's great. Yes. So we and so Harvard looked at my work and they said, you know, this open innovation stuff from Chesbro, I don't think it's going to be that important. And so I had to go to Berkeley. Uh, and then open innovation became very important. And so Berkeley was very happy. That's a, that's a really good luck for Berkeley in that case. Yes. And then more recently, I came to Asade also. So now I spend some of my time at Berkeley, but also some time at Asade. And I think it's also been good for Asade yes. uh, to have open innovation here. Yes. And one thing that I admire, I admire from you is that I mean, usually um, academia, usually uh, or scholars are said that uh, we live in our ivory towers, yes. okay? That we are, we are talking about things that are very far away from, our, from the real world. And I think that you are a living example of, of being able to create a theoretical framework, I mean, a very sound research, academic, but, but also have influence not only within the scholars and within the academia. I mean, the, uh, open innovation is an ubiquitous concept that people in, in the business world uh, innovation directors from great, uh, big and small companies they know, and even politicians. I mean, when they are thinking about how to create innovation policies, they have the references Open Innovation by Henry Chesbrough. So I think that you are also a, an example for, for, for the academia also, in order to, to see that many things that are happening in these uh, in these uh, centers, in these academic centers, I mean, it, it, they have impact in the real mm. world. So that's that's great. Talking now about open innovation in, in uh, the energy sector. Yes. I mean, yes. uh, you know that in the last year, uh, suddenly open innovation has become very popular in this uh, energy industry. I mean, today you can uh, see open innovation directors in the major uh, utilities and energy companies. I mean, Snyder, Veolia, uh, Inogi, uh, EDP are examples of companies that they are implementing or adopting open innovation in their innovation strategy. So which are your, your thoughts about that? So let me first say a little bit about the impact of open innovation. One of the benefits of me coming to Asade is it's allowed me to see the situation in Europe more closely. And I would say that the interest in open innovation is as great or greater here in Europe than it is even in the United States now. Uh, and these uh, political uh, groups that are embracing open innovation, I think, are embracing it most strongly here in Europe in the European Commission. Next week, we have a conference at Asade called the World Open Innovation Conference. One of our keynote speakers is Commissioner Carlos Moidas, the, uh, from the DG of Research, Science, and Innovation. And he's going to be speaking at our conference on the three opens, open science, open innovation and open to the world. Uh, he was a former student of mine when I was teaching at Harvard 20 years ago. And now he's a keynote speaker at our conference, so it's a great moment. Yeah. For the energy sector, I also agree with your question that uh, 10 years ago, nobody was talking about open innovation in the energy sector. There was growing interest in green and renewable technologies and solar and photovoltaics uh, geothermal, hydro, wind, but these were technologies. These were not 
new innovation processes. But in the last few years, the innovation processes in energy are starting to change. And organizations are starting to collaborate in ways they did not before. Business models are starting to open up. We're starting to see ecosystems of startups with large companies and regulators coming together to uh, bring some of these new possibilities to consumers in the energy sector. So it's a very exciting time to be looking at open innovation in the energy sector. Henry, uh, the energy industry is very traditional. I mean, it's, it's a kind of paradox somehow that um, they, they, their culture, I mean, very IP-centric, I mean, uh, non-disclosure agreements, uh, even the, the lawyers are coming very quickly when you start talking to them. So in this kind of, of environment, is it possible to apply open innovation? It's possible, but it is challenging, uh, indeed, for the reasons you say. The energy sector really can be thought of as a natural monopoly where once you have made the investment to generate megawatts or even gigawatts of power and then distribute them through these networks to millions of households, uh, there are natural economies of scale. And that means these monopolies have to be regulated so that we don't take all the money away from people and give it all to the energy sector. As a result, the culture is not especially innovative. Monopolies are not known for being rapidly responsive to customers' needs. And indeed, the energy companies often fund a lot of their capital with debt. And if a company has a lot of debt on its balance sheet, I think that constrains some of its ability to innovate because the people who are giving them the debt want to see a nice, steady business, very consistent, not too much, not too little, not too exciting. Uh, that's actually not the best environment for innovation and experimentation. Uh, one company I've looked at very recently uh, in Italy is a company called NL, uh, a leading energy utility company there who also owns about 70% of Endesa uh, here in Spain. Uh, so they have a very traditional background as well. But in the green and renewable sectors, they've become much more innovative and experimental in their work. And so they are an example to me that says, yes, open innovation is possible uh, in the energy sector if you can address some of the organizational challenges, some of the financial challenges, and ultimately the cultural challenges uh, that come with embracing open innovation. And in your experience, <clears throat> Is there any characteristics that the, cul the organizational culture should have in order to uh, adopt open innovation and to get the most of it? I would say at least two things. One is a willingness to share knowledge. Many organizations have grown through acquisition. Uh, NL would be one of these companies that has grown through acquisition. Many times when these entities are acquired, Knowledge is power. So if I hoard my knowledge, uh, that gives me influence in the organization. If I share everything with you, in this view, I've given away my power to you. But in an open innovation environment, you want people sharing knowledge freely and openly so that we can take my knowledge and your knowledge and put them together to combine to make something new. So instead of hoarding the knowledge, uh, we need a culture where sharing the knowledge is, is celebrated. The second thing I think that has to change is a willingness to embrace failure in the innovation process. You show me an organization that never fails, and I will show you an organization that never innovates. So we have to have a culture where it's okay to take experiments. It's okay to try new things, and we know that many of them are not going to work the first time. But if we are learning from them, and we share that learning widely, back to the first point, then we can begin to grow and adapt so that we find the things that do work, and then we can innovate successfully. Okay, so culture 
has to do with the sharing of that knowledge and also accepting that failure is part of the game. Yes. And celebrating yes. it and learning from it. That's right. Perfect. Those are two challenges for <laughs> the energy industry and for many large organizations, I think. One, one of the uh, characteristics that um, the energy industry is taking in order to implement open innovation is to resort to startups and to start collaborating with them. And this is something fantastic for us, for Inno Energy. As you know, uh, we have uh, supported 170 companies up to now. And we really believe from the, from the start that this collaboration is beneficial for both parties, for the startups, which are very innovative, very flexible, happy to customize their product, and, and they are willing to take the risk, okay, in order to introduce disruptive innovation. And on the other hand, we have the uh, major companies, the big companies, <coughs> that they have this uh, access to the customer, access to the market, and, and also they have the financial mus muscle and the, the financial strength to be able to take all this innovation and to scale up into the market. So have you, what, what are your advices in this collaboration? Because it's very frequent, but it's also very challenging. So uh, the first thing I would say is that the future of energy is going to require ecosystems of both large companies and startups. So the work that you are doing at Kick you know, Energy is crucial to the future of the sector. Small companies and startups are very quick, very agile. As you say, they're willing to take risk. And a market of 1 million euros for a startup is an exciting market. For a big energy company, one million euros is too small to be interesting. And the organization cannot move to, to explore that. So there's a natural benefit for large companies to engage with startup companies that do get excited by small markets. And every major opportunity begins as a small market. There's no significant business today that started at the very beginning in a way that was very, very large. They all start as small businesses. But you're also correct that the large companies have critical resources that the startups really need. Uh, one, of course, is the access to the end customer mm -hmm. and access to capital and financial markets, the regulatory environment. And one thing from the perspective of a startup is the ability to take a technology to scale to make it work in a very large volume, in a way that's very reliable. These are things that large companies are quite good at and are difficult for startups to master. So there's a natural combination of these that I think can work very well. And, okay, both of them are willing to collaborate, the startup and the big company. When the actual collaboration comes, then they face a lot of challenges. So which are the challenges that you, you, you have identified and, and, and of course how to uh, face them, how to overcome them? One of the biggest challenges I see is the difference in time, particularly the time to make a decision. A startup company can decide in a day or certainly in a week to make a major shift in what it's doing. But a large company often takes many weeks just to organize a meeting to then discuss the decision. Yeah. And in many of the large company situations, the result of the first meeting is a decision to have a second meeting because maybe there are some other people that need to be included. And it takes more weeks to find a date where everybody can come together and be at the meeting. This drives startups crazy because they see the opportunity, they're ready to engage with the large company, and all they need is a decision from the large company to say, yes, let's go. But the large company, because of all the actors that have to be involved, and we are going to try to take this to scale, so you need to consult with many different people in the company. I see you nodding. You've seen this problem too. Yes. This is the, one of the biggest challenges I see. A second challenge that I see is the question of intellectual property. Who is going to own what? When a large company and a small company do something together, 
Uh, the small company needs to own something or else they, they lose everything to the large company. But the large company is going to take this project and put it across millions of households. So they also need some protection or some access uh, to the technology as well. So this is something that's very delicate and has to be sorted out as well. And how to sort it out? There are a, a number of different models. Uh, the one that I am the most familiar with is you have your technology, I have my technology, and then we create something jointly together. Okay. So you keep yours, I keep mine, but we share what we create together. Maybe you own it, but I get a license to it that's royalty free so that I can use it too uh, without having to pay additional money. When I collaborated with you, that was my payment to you for the technology. So some kind of arrangement like this is what I see often in these cases. Mm -hmm. And of course, the startup has no money, so they cannot really give money to the large company. But the startup does have uh, talent and speed, and so they're often a very good way to test these new possibilities at small scale. Uh, in ways that large companies take a long time to do internally. So the startup community can be a test bed for the large companies in a range of technologies if we can overcome the time to decide and these intellectual property questions. One of the problems that also I have witnessed is that from the innovation department of the company, they are really eager and they see all these um, mutual benefits and then they are really willing to say, okay, if there are challenges, we will solve it. But then they go to the business unit, to the people who are in, in the ground, in the sales, uh, and, and they, they look for the, of course, the, 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 um, the let's say like the, the okay, of, the, of these departments, of the business units. And then there is also a, a gap there. There is also sometimes some time of tension. The innovation department see, oh, this is a great opportunity for us, but then the business uh, line uh, or the business unit people, they don't see it. Or they, they are very far away from collaborating with uh, in a small company and a startup. Or who are they? They are coming from outside. How to solve this? So this is a problem inside large companies, both when they deal with external parties from outside or when they deal with internal innovation groups as well. It really is the same problem because the business unit is being measured on their performance now, today, this month, this quarter, this year. And many of these innovation opportunities are about the future. They're about tomorrow, next year, next three years, next five years. And the business manager says, in five years, I'll be in another part of the company. So I give you my time now. Maybe I take the risk of working with you, mm -hmm. but the benefit will not come to me. The benefit will come to the person after me. So if it doesn't work, maybe I am punished but if it does work, the benefit goes to somebody else. So you can see why there's a problem there in doing this. And part of the problem is how companies manage the current businesses. Often there's no scope for the current businesses to take these risks, to invest some of these monies that might cause the current performance to go down a little bit. Uh, and this, I think, is one of the challenges for the large company, whether they're dealing with an internal innovation group or an external startup. Mm -hmm. So somehow it would be a possibility that these business units, uh, they are not only focused on exploitation, but also a bit on exploration, like uh, the ambidextrous organization, so that they can take a bit of chance to, to, to take the risk on these projects and not only focusing on the short-term results. That's exactly right. Uh, any company that wants to grow and sustain themselves over time has to be, to, has to do a good job of exploitation, but has to do more than that. They also have to do some exploration as well. And even if you're working with external companies like startups, 
you still have to have processes in your own company to be able to receive this work, to absorb it, to work with it, and then to change your internal processes. And so what you were describing as ambidexterity uh, is a term in the management literature now for this process of how do we execute the current business but explore and grow a new business at the same time. Other challenges that they now that we are facing in the energy uh, industry is innovation in business models. Yes. Suddenly they, they have realized that uh, technology is not the only thing that exists in the world and that sometimes they need to resort to, to innovate on business models. And, and it's very interesting because your second book, you, you, you migrate from the open innovation comp uh, uh, strategy to something even more deeper because it was open bis uh, business uh, innovation mo business models that's right so it's not only innovation strategy but it is the whole concept of the company so what is this really an open business model so uh, in the first book of open innovation I was showing with companies like Xerox that they had a hard time when new technologies came out of their laboratories if those did not fit the Xerox business model, they did not know what to do with them. And they had many of these false negatives we talked about, where they had to find a different business model to become valuable. In the second book, I said, what if you could innovate the business model as well as the technology and have a more open business model? This might have solved some of the problems I saw at Xerox. So an open business model means that the processes of value creation and value capture are themselves open and are often shared with external parties. So a quick example that will be familiar to many people watching this interview would be either the Google Play or Apple App Store, where Google and Apple maintain these stores and you can get all your apps from these stores and, and buy them on Google Play or on Apple iOS and when you buy them most of the money goes to the app maker but some of the money goes to Apple or to Google and by opening up their store this way Google and Apple do two things one is they create a market for all these application providers that would be very difficult for the application providers to do on their own the second thing they do is they make their own solution much more valuable to their customers because we as phone users use our phones for lots of different purposes and Google and Apple don't have to think about which are the best ones they can create a market and we as consumers can just make our choices and the market helps decide what are the valuable things so these are examples of platforms that create value creation and value capture in a much more open and distributed way. In energy, we're starting to see smart grids. We're starting to see smart power meters and two-way uh, movement of, car of car current, both to the house but also back to the grid. And the possibility now of dynamic pricing, uh, engaging and collaborating, with consumers not just as users of energy but potentially as also producers of energy. So again I think some of these platform approaches uh, are going to be very valuable in the energy sector as well. Yes, indeed I think that the energy sector can learn a lot about what other companies in other sectors have been doing. And <clears throat> when I was uh, uh, coming back to, to the book you gave me some time ago, the Open Service Innovation, I was very happy because one of the trends today in the energy sector is energy as a service. Yes. And that is exactly what, what, uh, one, one of the conclusions that you were talking in the book some years ago. So I thought, oh, I mean, I think that, that that would be really, really valuable. I mean, that the energy industry could see what other industries have been doing because indeed it is not so different in that sense. So what do you think about now turning energy and energy as a service? So in the uh, company NL I described to you a few minutes ago, I had the opportunity to spend some time with their CEO, Francesco mm -hmm. Starace. 
And he said something to me about energy as a service that just amazed me. Once he said it, I could see it very clearly, but I had never thought of it until he told me. In California, where I live, electric vehicles are very popular. We have Tesla, but also the Chevy Volt, and now the Chevy Bolt, and some other all-electric vehicles from Nissan and so forth. What Storace told me was with a smart grid and two-way charging and electric vehicles that utilities like NL could not only deliver and charge your vehicle, but they could also rent back energy from your vehicle when you're not using it so that the electric vehicles become distributed mobile energy storage in addition to providing transportation. And so NL can actually offer you lots of money during the day when you're, maybe your car's in a garage. They can buy back the energy from your vehicle uh, during the middle of the day when energy use is high, but you're at the office. And then at the end of the day when you need to go home, they give you back the energy and you drive home. So for us as car owners, our cars are not only transportation, but they can act, we can also be energy providers. So this to me was just amazing to have a utility executive explain this to me. I think that, that that's part of the energy transition that uh, the energy sector is trying to do, but also politicians and us as citizens. I would love to have this kind of, of new systems in place. Well, to me, if we can do this, it's going to be even more cool than Justin Bieber. <laughs> yes, for sure, for sure. <laughs> yes. One last question, Henry, because uh, you know that in no energy, from the from the from the scratch, uh, we were really thinking about embed, uh, embed, embedding the concept of open innovation, and indeed, what um, we 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 created was a platform to collaborate, yes. and what uh, but it is organized as a company, and then we are trying to put together the students, the professors, the researchers from the research centers, also the startups, the SMEs, and the the, the large industry, and and. Um, you know the project from the, from the start, it was first a project, then it became a big business plan, suddenly we were setting up a company, and now we have been running for five years. So what do you think about this experiment? Because indeed, I mean, it was, it was something new. We, we didn't know how it was going to be, but, but the idea was to, to create a platform where collaborations mm, could be as smooth as possible. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Well, as you say, uh, you're five years old now. You're supporting 170 different organizations. You've really built uh, an ecosystem and a community of both large organizations and small ones, uh, also academics and researchers. So to me, it's been an exciting experiment to watch. And I'm going to get to spend the day with you today learning all the latest developments. So I'm, I'm very excited about what you're doing, and I think our energy future is going to require these kinds of communities and ecosystems. It's going to require embracing new technologies, lots of experiments, some new business models as well. Uh, so I think it's an exciting time and it's great to see all the progress you've made in the past five years. So Henry, thanks a lot for this wonderful interview. I have learned a lot. I hope that you had a, also a great time here with us. Elena, it's a great pleasure. I'm so proud of all the success that you and your team are building here, and I think it's an exciting time to be working on open innovation in the energy sector. Yes, thank you.